recording the uh, this meeting. And so very briefly, uh, this is the first end on session. As we uh, say during the first plenary session, we'll have one plenary session and then one uh, hand on session during all the uh, living lab. Today is the day of the problems. So our problem holders will uh, present uh, the uh, some real problem that they are meeting in in their experience uh, experiencing in uh, in their business and they, they that we can use as an exercise for this uh, living lab. Uh, so we'll have three presentation, one for uh, the three, uh, one of for each sectors of Medgold, so for olive oil, wine, and drum wheat and pasta. And uh, as very quickly to recap what we have said during the first session, after that the presentation will start the uh, team's works and uh, um, we sh you should be divided in three teams and and each team should complete uh, a workflow an idealized workshop uh, workflow for, um, for a climate service including the three principal aspect of the climate service that analysis user interaction and commercial exploitation for sure uh, each of the exercise will be more focused on one of these aspects even if all the aspects should be uh, tackled during uh, the um, during the exercise and however uh, due the, to the multidisciplinary nature of climate service all the three components will be for sure relevant and present in each workflow so uh, finally, let me just recap that the possible output expected from the team's works should be the design of a workshop or of, of interview or surveys to interact with users or develop a sort of application code to do some additional analysis for an, uh, analysis for them or <clears throat> the development sorry of a commercial exploitation strategy for the company. So in this case, if there are a clear uh, problem and there is something already <clears throat> existing we could start thinking to some something to better improve what uh, the uh, what is already existing and to put this um, service closer to the market so uh, I think that this is uh, all from my side I think that we could immediately start with the per the first uh, presentation, the first presentation will be um, on the olive oil sector. So I am mm, happy to leave the floor to uh, Luigi for introducing the uh, olive oil problem and our problem holder. Thank you, Luigi. Yeah, thanks, Alessandro. More than the problem, I would like to introduce uh, Javier Lopez uh, from the COP. And he's been a key person in our project, DCOP, and this is valid for the rest of the problem holders that you will listen to today. They are uh, probably the main, the core value of, of our project. Um, they're really key stakeholders in, in the food systems, in, in the global food system. They, they're very large, they are, they are on top of things. I personally had a hard time catching up with them because they're very good technically and they're very um, close to what happens on the market and in the, on the, in the field. So it's a great opportunity from my point of view for uh, all of you attending the, the Living Lab to uh, having a chance to interact directly with them. Uh, so keep this in mind and, and come up with good questions and you know, uh, use your time as best as you can because uh, it, this is a very good opportunity. And coming back to the COP, they are the top producer of olive, olive oil and table olives. They're based in, in Spain. Most of the, their olive oil producers are in Andalusia, which is the top, number one uh, region for olive oil production in the world. They are a second degree cooperative, meaning that they um, they gather several cooperatives that are themselves uh, cooperatives. So 
The cup is, is, made, is made up of um, cooperative olive oil mills, so they, where the ol olive fruit is transformed into olive oil. And the olive oil mills themselves, they are a cooperative of olive, olive growers. And collectively, the cup uh, um, is made up of like 75,000 uh, family farms across, mostly across Andalusia, but also in, the, in, in other regions of Spain. So they're very large. And it, it was really, um, the cup it, itself is co-leader of the work package too which is uh, where our project uh, project develops the case study on the climate service for the olive and olive oil sector. They co lead this work package, uh, in part, uh, specifically uh, Javier has been doing this job together with the National uh, Observatory of, of Athens in, in Greece. And what, what's, what's really been interesting about DCOP is that because they are a second degree cooperative, they have a range of needs that is incredibly, incredibly wide. So they go from the field, and we have been uh, interacted mostly uh, at that level because there's a network of field technicians and, and um, extension is basically that advise people in the field on things like uh, fertilization, irrigation, and pest management across Andalusia. And there's associ associations for integrated production that kind of supervise that. So we, we, we started with that, with climate services, but you, go, you can go up and, and see the COP as a, as a player in the, in the market of olive oil itself, because they are able to really influence also the price because they you know they sell and buy large amounts of oil so this level will be the one that probably will be uh, addressed mostly in in the example and the problem that uh, javier will be presenting to you the rest you can see it in the website and check what we have done it, it is most more towards the field more towards um, management of, of a farm. The what we work, what you're gonna see today is is mostly from the perspective of the cop, the company. So they uh, they buy and and sell all olive oil, and they they're like they would like to know what what's the situation of the olive oil market internationally. Thank you, and please uh, Javier address our audience. Of course, if anybody has questions, I'm 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 available, but I will turn off my mic. Uh, thank you, Luigi. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, well, I am going to introduce the the problem from from the olive uh, sector. So uh, we can go to the first uh, slide next, please. Well, uh, in my first uh, slide, I I prepare a, a introduction from me uh, from from the cup, but in this case, no, is necessary because uh, the, the introduce or the Luigi introduction was really complete. Um, but uh, only added um, uh, that the cup is the 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 first um, or the biggest uh, cooperative in, in, in the south of, of Europe in terms of um, annual turnover uh, because uh, we, we have several um, uh, agri-food uh, sessions such as wine, livestock or, or nuts uh, another um, and well uh, we can Go to the, the next, next slide. Um, well, the, the, the challenge uh, that the COP will like to, to, to show in this uh, Living Lab 2021 uh, is to uh, know the situation of the olive sector in the, in the next uh, year at, at, at different levels. 
levels. Um, uh, of course, in Andalusia region, because the the, the first um, uh, producer uh, region in the world, as uh, Luigi said before, um, and uh, the most interesting region uh, for the COP, because in in this region uh, uh, are the the majority number of first degree cooperative. Uh, associated with, with the COP. Uh, but also, uh, as a second level of priority in, in Spain, uh, uh, Europe and, and, and the world uh, is the, the other um, level. Um, uh, and, and well, the, the, the goal for the participants uh, is to develop a climate service uh, that uh, estimate the, the volume of the olive oil um, that will produce uh, in Andalusia or even Spanish, European, and or uh, global, for global from uh, 2030, 31 to, to forward. Um, to complete this challenge, um, we believe uh, some information about uh, 3K point will be uh, shown in this presentation. Uh, this information regarding is are regarding uh, the olive production and climate variables, uh, the trend of the new plantation um, of the olive crop, and the price and consumption of olive oil in in, in in the war in, in Spain. Um, in the in, in the last um, slide, uh, there will be um, the lead of the user reference uh, to to more to more information. Uh, in, in, uh, previous slide, Luigi, please. Uh, because in in the previous um, uh, picture uh, um, we launched uh, another uh, question uh, for instance the, the, uh, for instance um, the only sector uh, need to to know if uh, the current olive oil produ produce uh, area uh, stop producing the, the olive oil or um, if uh, the new area will appear as an olive oil uh, producer uh, area. This this uh, could be a, an, another uh, question uh, to to answer in this living lab. Now, uh, yes, uh, um, we can go to the, the next slide. Uh, before um, uh, before um, providing the, the information of, of, of olive oil and climate uh, information, I would like to, to show a brief, very brief overview of the olive sector uh, so that you can understand the, the relationship uh, between the farmer and, and the cooperative. Uh, the, the most important point is to know the, the associate farmers uh, with the co at the hour of the uh, olive farm and they manage their own, own uh, farm, um, farms uh, of olive and harvest their the own olives. Uh, however, uh, as a result of the association among uh, farmers, appear the, the first degree cooperative, in this case the, the olive mill, uh, to transform the olive into olive oil. Here, uh, there are two, two, two important points. The owner of those uh, fifth degree cooperative are the farmers, and the fifth degree cooperative have to process all, all the olive that uh, the associated farmer deliver on it. Uh, then, as a result of the, of the joining uh, of first degree cooperative, the olive mill, uh, to commercialize all the, the olive oil, uh, appear the second degree cooperative. Um, and 
and here uh, again uh, we have uh, two important points um, the the owner of the second degree cooperative are the farmer and the second degree cooperative has to commercialize all the olive oil uh, that the the associate first degree or the associate um, farmer uh, produce. Um, uh, it's um, in in the in the picture at the bottom of the slide. Uh, it's a summary of the relationship between the the farmer uh, and the co. It's a it's a sample. Um, only for clarification, but uh, uh, will be. Uh, update in the in the repository and, and I don't explain and now and next uh, slide and in, in the in this um, in this uh, moment uh, um, now uh, as uh, as other crop uh, the olive farm um, are affected by the the weather uh, condition in this uh, moment, in this slide, uh, we we will see as the the temperature affect to the the olive tree um, in its uh, vegetable and phenologic uh, annual cycle. Uh, although uh, I will focus on the K condition in, in this, but uh, you can uh, check all the 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 uh, clar um, clarification on, on that um, in winter uh, the olive uh, tree needs a uh, mean temperature around uh, zero um, celsius degrees uh, i always uh, speak in celsius uh, degree uh, but the thermal sensation uh, mustn't uh, be below uh, seven Celsius uh, degrees below zero. Um, in, a, in, in a spring, uh, the olive tree needs um, mean temperature above 10 um, uh, Celsius degree to start the, the vegetable development. And um, mine um, or, or end of spring, uh, the mean temperature uh, will be uh, above uh, 18 uh, Celsius degree to, to start the, the flowering. Also, it uh, needs a maximum temperature below uh, to 32 uh, degree. Uh, a minimum temperature uh, must be uh, above uh, uh, zero uh, Celsius degree. Uh, in summer, uh, noise in, in our uh, experience or in our opinion, the, the temperature noise very uh, relevant to, to the olive tree because the olive tree can um, tolerate temperature above uh, 14 uh, Celsius degree uh, because the, the olive tree um, uh, do a, a summer store. Uh, the olive tree with, with the high temperature stop the, the photosynthesis process. And in autumn, the, the most relevant is the, the minimum temperature uh, mustn't be below uh, zero de uh, Celsius degree. Um, for the next, please, uh, is all known for the temperature. And now uh, we talk about the, the, pre the precipitation because the olive uh, has a natural uh, alteration in, in the production. Uh, this uh, natural olive tree alteration causes cause, um, be different and in olive olive oil production between the year. The, uh, and estimating the, the, the olive production in, in advance, uh, in, in the core try to, to predict uh, with six, uh, eight, uh, 12 uh, months in, in, a, in, a, in advance, 
is critical to the commercialization strategy. Uh, according to, to the co experiment a relevant climate variable in Andalusia that affect um, the olive oil production is the precipitation from October to May. Uh, we, uh, the COP, uh, could uh, conclude that the threshold um, uh, regarding the, the precipitation is around uh, 450 liters per year. Uh, in more details, uh, year wind precipitation from October to May are close to, to 450 uh, liters uh, per year. Um, uh, will be a, a normal um, uh, volume of, of uh, olive oil production. Uh, however, uh, the, the, the year um, uh, in which uh, the, the precipitation exceeds uh, to, to 415 liters, uh, we can expect a high olive oil production at the year um, um, in which the precipitation is below of this um, uh, precipitation, we expect a, a low uh, olive oil production. Uh, taking into account it, the, the, the next uh, in the next uh, slide, uh, we'll show a classification of Andalusia olive oil season according, according to Andalusia precipitation from October to April, because the COP um, for the estimation uh, calculate the, the precipitation to, to from uh, October to, to April. Um, um, this precipitation is used by, by the code to predict the, the olive oil production with this uh, 6, uh, 10 or 12 uh, months in advance. Um, the olive, uh, olive uh, oil production. Uh, just your information, the, the precipitation data information was collected by the the reference one uh, and the olive oil production data from world uh, by reference two and Spain and, and, uh, and Andalusia uh, by the reference three. Um, well, in, in this uh, first table, uh, show the cost uh, olive oil uh, season classification, which is based on the Andalusia precipitation from October to April, from the previous um, year that is now in, in, is in shown in the first column of the, of the olive uh, production for each uh, season. But also the olive oil production at uh, another level, uh, other level in, in order to show the relationship between precipitation and olive oil production. Uh, production. Even production. Sorry, sorry, just two minutes, please. Ah, okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, and well, uh, the call classification of the, the, the GI in, in good, bad, or normal regarding it. Uh, next slide, please. Um, other point to to go in, into to take into consideration is um, the the production in the future the the trend of the new olive uh, tree plantation. Uh, next, please. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, yes. Um, to know is the current olive oil area will will continue to to produce olive in the future. Uh, well, uh, uh, the COP will emphasize um, several points. Uh, for instance, the, the olive tree needs climate, climate in which the four season, uh, winter, spring, summer, and autumn, are clearly discriminated and coming gradually. The optimal annual precipitation is around six or um, six, uh, eight. 100 liters per year. The annual, annual uh, mean 
uh, temperature uh, must be 10, uh, 30 degree. And, but the, the optimal is around 50, 20. And as we, we see before in, in the... Please, Margarita, mute your mic, please. Thank you. In winter, uh, we have the, the temperature precipitation of the season. Uh, next. Uh, this is the, the trend of the new plantation from Spain and Andalusia. Uh, we can see the total surface. But the olive uh, tree can be used used to olive uh, oil and table olive. Uh, for that, uh, we can see the surface of olive tree from uh, from olive oil. Uh, and um, other uh, important thing is the the system, the irrigation system. Uh, you can see the the most popular uh, system is the no irrigation system. Uh, next, please. Mm, in, in this is uh, the, the same information by in, in, in graph and you can see all the, the, the last uh, 15 years and next uh, in the same direction that this is the, the trend of new plantation from from Europe uh, and world but in this case we have uh, we don't have much uh, detail in information detail it information on it, and next, please. Um, the, the third part of the presentation uh, is the, the, the consumer uh, and the price. Uh, the price depends on the production because in the next slide, please, uh, we can see the, the price at the, at the origin in, in the, the price uh, who, which uh, pay to, to farmer. Uh, is different every year. We can see the three most popular or most important olive oil, the extra virgin olive, the virgin, and the refinate or normal olive oil. And you can see the, the, the price of the last 15 years and the average of this year. Uh, we can go to the next slide because the next slide is similar, but in this case, the price the price by the consumer. Um, well, yeah, in the next, uh, we have the consumers of of, um, of the of the olive uh, oil, virgin extra and um, uh, normal olive oil in the world in the Spain, virgin. And, and extra virgin olive oil. In, in, in red, um, uh, we uh, underline the, the year in which the consumption uh, decreased according to the previous year. Uh, the, next slide, the next, please. And um, Javier, please uh, consider is, that you have to, to close <laughs> your yeah. presentation. Is, uh, however, it, there will Time for your for question in the next uh, uh, session for sure. It's a, it's a, uh, sorry, yes. Uh, this table shows the, the average cost of each uh, olive cross system according to the, the, the information provided for by uh, 15 country members of International Olive Council. Uh, take into account this average cost, we can conclude that this most uh, year. The only sector need the common uh, agricultural policy outside to, to survive. Uh, and next is the, the, the final, because in the next, I, I um, remind that the goal is uh, um, uh, develop a climate service for producing the, the volume of olive oil. And the next is uh, the, the the list of the reference we use it. Um, and the last is the thank you for your attention and, and, and my email uh, for any question. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. thank you very much.
Thank you very much, uh, Javier. Uh, thank you very much for this quite comprehensive uh, presentation of the problem for the uh, olive oil sector. Uh, please uh, let me remind that uh, there will be uh, time for uh, uh, the question uh, in the next plenary session on Thursday. And so you can uh, ask uh, the, every kind of question to Javier, especially uh, for the team that will be assigned to this kind of uh, exercise. So I think that if uh, I don't know if there are some very quick question for uh, uh, for Javier. Uh, let me just ask to the <laughs> this presentation. Yes. Okay. Just yes. a question. Uh, yes. The data you use that have a micro data or, or yeah, other small data consider consider for example for precipitation the temperature uh, the, the day of the month every month or, or, or the, the 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 data about precipitation refer to the annual precipitation because it is very different uh, for the evapotranspiration it's very different so the the you uh, the um, to use uh, uh, daily precipitation than annual precipitation. And uh, the second question about the price, uh, the price are a cast, uh, current price or the constant price? And uh, uh, suggestions, um, I suggested to use a standard output uh, develop, developed by Eurostat because it's, um, it, um, it, is, it is important standard output, output related to price to, to, to compare the different prices in, uh, in different countries, especially in Europe and uh, in all over the world. Okay. Okay, thank you, Rosanna, for your question. Uh, regarding the, the last question, uh, we collect the, the price uh, of, uh, of olive oil uh, in Spain in uh, by the, the annual statistic uh, uh, document of uh, Ministry of Agriculture Ministry from, uh, from Spain. Uh, the cost from the, the production uh, is an um, uh, inform to a report, sorry, a report uh, by the International Council Olive. Um, uh, this uh, report uh, was uh, result uh, from a survey in the in the in the uh, 15 um, country. Uh, you can see the, the in the link. You can see the the, the documents. Um, from the first uh, question regarding the, the first uh, question, um, uh, the COP. Um, um, collect the, the information about from uh, several um, uh, weather stations in, in Andalusia. So uh, we uh, collect the information, uh, calculate the, the precipitation uh, every year um, after in our uh, experience uh, the, the, the 450 uh, liter per year is the 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 limit. Uh, if you is in Andalusia, if in Andalusia uh, the precipitation reach uh, this uh, this uh, volume, uh, we can expect uh, a normal. Uh, precipitation, but but this information uh, is uh, our uh, experience. Um, the other um, uh, information, uh, for instance, the 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 temperature in in winter or temperature in in spring, uh, we uh, collect we in in the in the. Uh, in the report, or I don't remember me in the list. No, is there isn't the the reference, but um, 
we check a, a, a bibliographic report and, and show this information. Okay, thank you, Javier. Uh, I don't think that we have time for further questions, but uh, as I uh, let, let me remind that you could uh, uh, store your question for Javier for the next plenary session, especially if you are in the team working on the olive oil. So uh, now we can uh, move to the second problem presented uh, by Antonio Grassa. Uh, Antonio Grassa is um, the, the chief of the research department in uh, Sogrape. Sogrape is uh, one of the biggest uh, family company from Portugal um, for wine, for uh, viticulture, and the core business uh, of Sogrape is in the Duru Valley, but they have um, the uh, wine vineyard all around the world, and um, so uh, I, I think that you should have some more insight on this in the presentation. And let me also remind that Antonio Grassa uh, is one of our most proactive and enthusiastic member of Medgold uh, project, and it is something very, very relevant for us because he has uh, a very innovative point of view and uh, he is a, one of the, our industrial champions. And so it's a pleasure for me to leave the floor to uh, Antonio. Thanks, Antonio. Just let me understand how I can put your screen as a full screen, but <laughs> over there we can. Um, and uh, let me just check how I can. Yeah, 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 okay. Thank you, Antonio, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alessandro. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I cannot see your screen share. I'm trying to bring it over here. See if I can. Yeah, okay, I got it now. So um, I hope uh, my, my audio and image is coming well your way. I'm not in my usual office, so I'm in the Douro Valley and the coverage with the network is not as good in here. So, I can you hear very well. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. You very good. Thank you, Alessandro. Okay, good. So, um, I'm bringing you a problem from the grape and wine industry. Um, and uh, I would like to say a few words about this industry. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, the, the wine industry... Just a moment, is... sorry, Antonio. I, I, that's it. Yeah, okay. that's it. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Alessandro. So wine, as you probably all or almost all know, um, is the product of uh, the fermentation of grapes. Uh, but it makes for a very uh, unique type of, um, of, of product, of food product. Um, as um, it, um, it is uh, produced in a very wide area across the, the world. Um, very much uh, influenced in its style and taste according to the place where it is grown, um, but mostly produced by from one single uh, species uh, of plant, the European grapevine, Vitis vinifera. Uh, however, a plant that has a huge genetic diversity uh, catering for uh, its own adaptation to quite different and uh, wide range of climates and soils um, across the world. Typically, we say that uh, you can grow uh, grapevines and produce good wine up to about 50 degrees latitude, both on the north and southern hemisphere. However, uh, due to uh, regional conditions, this may vary and you may uh, produce at higher altitudes in areas where because of uh, ocean currents, you have uh, a warmer uh, temperature, uh, sorry, a warmer uh, climate. Um, or, and you uh, can in other areas because of co cooler uh, influences uh, not grow uh, as well in um, 
in 45 or 50 degrees uh, latitude. So there is a, a little bit of variation. Of course, with the climate change, this, is, this has been uh, under pressure and there has been some changes. We are seeing now um, a flourishing wine industry in the southern areas of the United Kingdom, for instance, uh, producing already uh, uh, quite high quality wines, mostly sparkling wines, but of a very good quality and sold at high prices. And we are seeing uh, wine regions uh, being developed in southern Sweden, Denmark, southern Norway, even in some places of Finland and quite in, uh, in, in increasing areas of Poland, for instance, and also in southern Russia. So uh, this is something that is under, under pressure and under change right now. Uh, but it must be understood that this diversity has created across the markets in the world and today the market for wine is very much global. It has created um, a very diverse demand. That is, uh, you find consumers for all types of wines um, and you very seldom find one consumer that sticks for all the time to the same type of wine without variation. So this is something that um, is taken in very individually by each person uh, for their own taste. Next slide, please. For this, the way the grapevine um, works in terms of, um, uh, of, of using sunlight and, um, and uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and water from the soil in order to create um, sugary reserves, mostly under the form of glucose and fructose, but also several other uh, compounds, uh, dictates the composition of grapes and the taste of the wine uh, that you get when you uh, ferment those grapes. So uh, from here you can understand that uh, if you have a specific type of wine uh, being produced in a given area, a given region, uh, for decades, even centuries, and you have um, uh, a vast number of consumers used to finding that type of wine from that region, when the region becomes subject to climate change, um, the, the taste of uh, the wines uh, uh, will change because the composition of the grapes will change. Grapes will become uh, more and more sugary or uh, they will develop different uh, flavor compounds that will change the taste of the wine. And that creates a pressure onto um, the, the, the relationship between the producer and the consumer by the product that is put out. Another thing that changes is also the behavior of the grapevine in terms of its um, vegetative development and also in terms of uh, um, sensitivity to different diseases. And uh, this may create challenges of its own. Next slide, please. Uh, because um, in areas that um, you are not uh, uh, used to have uh, specific uh, diseases or pests, you may start finding them. So for this, uh, for this uh, exercise, I propose that uh, we, uh, we focus on uh, uh, the, the area where I am right now, the, the, the Doro Valley, um, and on a specific uh, place on the eastern part of the Doro Valley uh, at those coordinates 41 degrees 1 minute 20 seconds north and 7 degrees 0 minutes 59 uh, seconds west. Uh, an area that traditionally uh, is very warm and dry but because of climate variability, it has been withstanding some problems that, in some years that it wasn't used to. Next slide, please. So one of uh, those problems is uh, what we call uh, uh, downy mildew. Uh, downy mildew is a fungal disease uh, that is provoked uh, or caused by um, a fungus, uh, uh, Plasmopora diticola. Um, and it hits mostly during springtime and early summertime when there is a lot of uh, humidity or uh, uh, even when there is uh, uh, rain quite often. Um, 
the the what happens is that uh, the the fungus will eat onto the inflorescences uh, and the um, the young uh, berries and uh, when you come to harvest time uh, the difference between a sane and a diseased bunch is what you see in this picture typically on average uh, translating at about 30% yield loss uh, but in extreme situations, uh, may, uh, may very well go as high as 80-90% of, uh, of losses, which is close to total loss. Uh, next slide. Another uh, problem uh, that uh, is also caused by fungus and fungal disease is what we call powdery mildew. Powdery mildew is uh, caused by a different type of fungus. It's not Plasmopora, it's Erisife necator. And uh, it has a total different biological cycle. Whereas for, um, for Plasmopora, you need uh, uh, high humidity and even uh, rain for uh, uh, severe outbreaks. Uh, for powdery mildew, you need a, a concurrence of high temperatures and high uh, uh, humidity but not as high as you need for downy mildew. Uh, for example, on warm, dry regions, if you have vineyards with um, a lot of vigor, with a lot of uh, shoots and leaves, creating a protected environment around the trunk, even the, if the temperature outside is high, uh, on that protected uh, environment, you may get enough uh, humidity for uh, the, um, the fungus to develop. And that becomes particularly uh, fearful uh, because uh, uh, in, in, under those conditions it will develop very strongly and quite often at, this, at those points, because you have high temperatures, uh, um, the, the, the most traditional treatment that you can uh, use, it's just not possible. Um, because you cannot apply it above 28 degrees uh, Celsius. That is the, the application of uh, sulfur, powder sulfur, uh, uh, for control. So the only other way is uh, aerating the, the, the area of the bunches, so the, the area in the center of the plant, by removing leaves, removing shoots to create a, a, a pathway for wind to come in and air to come in. The downside of that, is especially on warm regions and in warm years, and now more and more with climate change, is that when you do that, you expose the bunches to sunlight. And that is great because it will uh, kill uh, the fungus, but has the, the side effect that if temperatures are too high and, or, or too uh, uh, prolonged, as in the case of heat waves, you will also get uh, uh, sunburn on the, um, on the berries. So for, for a, a grower in an area like this, there is always a balance and something that he has to, to take into consideration when addressing, addressing the prevention of powdery mildew, which is the risk of getting uh, uh, sunburn. And the losses can be pretty much equivalent uh, in, uh, in, in terms of, uh, of quantity. Next slide, please. So, the problem that um, I bring you here today, bearing in mind that um, uh, the actual prevention of loss, and I mean yield loss translating as economic loss for, the, for a farmer, um, would be what is a, a, a price that the farmer would be willing to pay in order to have a climate service that would correctly forecast uh, and allow him to decide what to do in the face of these uh, two, three problems, because I'm talking downy mildew, powdery mildew and sunburn, um, according to two uh, criteria. One is the accuracy of the forecast and the other is the size of the property. Uh, because, of course, as you can well understand, the, sc the, the, the scale of economics are totally different if you are considered a small holding property of one hectare or a large uh, um, uh, property of 160 hectares. Just for you to have an idea, I chose the one hectare uh, um, size 
because that is the average size of the properties in this in this region. So uh, uh, the average is uh, even a little bit lower than this is 0 0.9 hectare. And properties uh, of 160 hectares in this area are very much the exception. There should be a handful of them uh, to, 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 to count. Um, properties with more than 10 hectares represent less than 10% of total and properties with more than 30 hectares represent less than 1% uh, of total. So uh, the small holding is the norm in this, in this region and so it is important because um, uh, uh, we have a coexistence in the region of these two uh, situations. Uh, it is important to understand what would be the economics of such a climate service for each situation considering that uh, quite likely um, it will be easier for someone who owns um, a large uh, area to offset the cost of the climate service. But in both cases, and also considering the accuracy of the forecast, it will be important to just understand uh, what, what, uh, how much they would be uh, willing to pay. Next slide, please. So for this, I provide you a number of data uh, regarding the average cost of uh, a treatment for downy mildew. Um, uh, and considering uh, the, if you are planning for it well in advance because that means that you may buy the products for protection uh, at better prices than if you have to react on the spot to an outbreak and you order your products with just two week advance. So there are uh, uh, economic considerations regarding that. You also have um, uh, an estimate, an average estimate of how much product uh, you use uh, for, for the treatment uh, and also uh, the, the, the cost of labor uh, for managing the canopy. The canopy is, is the vegetative size of, uh, of, of the grapevines. So for cutting leaves, uh, cutting shoots, also data on the average yield on the, on the region and you can well understand that this is a region that the yields uh, very low amounts. This is uh, the, the, the average uh, and that's because the soils here are quite poor and rainfall is quite uh, scarce and also uh, the value of uh, the kilo of grape and the, the downgrade on that value if the grape is attained by uh, powdery uh, mildew. Then you have a set of considerations in there and I'm, I did not uh, uh, go very far on, the, on, the, on making available a lot of data because we will have opportunities to, uh, to speak again so you will uh, be able to put your doubts to me and uh, uh, you also have the possibility of writing me an email or contacting me in LinkedIn so uh, I can provide you some quick answers to something that, uh, that comes up. Next slide please. So this is it and uh, I, I hope that you find this uh, uh, an exciting and challenging problem and I can tell you that uh, me and my colleagues at SOGRAP uh, we are quite interested to see what comes out of this exercise. Thank you very much, good learning. Thank you very much Antonio for the very interesting presentation, very exciting uh, problem for the teams that should work on this and uh, we have time for a quick question and uh, let us know if there are okay there is a, a hand raised by Tony please Tony hey Antonio yeah. uh, thanks a lot for for this presentation I was wondering what kind of time scale you're looking at um with your with your climate services is it weekly is it seasonal is it an annual type of forecast um yeah uh given given the considerations and the fact that uh, you need to um, consider the value of the service uh, for uh, uh, the, the activity i think you should consider it uh, on a seasonal basis on a year by year uh, campaign uh, basis because otherwise uh, uh, it would not make much much sense. Uh, you will probably see as you develop uh, the, the exercise 
that uh, when you are considering the planning of a campaign, uh, it means that uh, you should consider for the next three to six months, which is uh, more or less the time frame of the decisions that we have to make. And just a quick follow up, um, and I, I got I gather from your from your previous slide that there are certain restrictions about what can be done under which con conditions. What if there's nothing that can be done, even though the forecast is you know very accurate and very reliable? What if there's nothing that can be done because it's too warm, or you, you the grapes would suffer from sunburn. Well, there is something. Uh, there is always something that can be done. If it is too warm and the and the grapes will suffer from sunburn, then you don't have a problem with the powdery mildew because it will be just too warm for 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 powdery mildew as well. Uh, so of course we for a, for an exercise like this, we cannot consider every situation, every possible situation. What I recommend is that you consider more uh, uh, contrasting situations, a situation where you have uh, uh, um, uh, temperatures which are high enough for the development of uh, the fungus, but not too high that it would cause a sunburn, and another situation which is the opposite when you have too high uh, uh, temperatures that may cause sunburn, uh, but uh, and that therefore you won't have a problem with powdery mildew because you just wouldn't have uh, um, uh, humidity conditions for the, the disease to develop. So I believe this would be the the, the right approach: create these contrasting <coughs> situations and uh, and addressing the value of the service for each one of those. Thank you very much. And final question by Maria. Please, very quick question, please. Okay. Uh, hello, Antonio. I found your presentation very, very interesting, and that uh, led me to to think on uh, several subjects. For example, uh, about um, environmental conditions uh, that uh, there are some abiotic stresses, high temperature, low, low humidity. Uh, do you have any information about the water uptake capacity from groups that could allow to control the stomatal conductance and so on, the leaf temperature, transpiration rates that can help to delay the leaf senescence in order to improve the uh, canopy development to protect the grapes? Uh, do you have any information about that? Yes, you can pretty much uh, uh, assume that uh, under summer conditions in this region, you are usually uh, uh, from from July onwards, you are in a situation where you do not have any growth at all, because the the hydric restriction will be uh, too high. So it's typical to have uh, between. Uh, 0.4 and 0.8 megapascals, negative megapascals uh, of um, pre-dawn potential, not stem, pre-dawn potential. Okay? Yeah. So that is, uh, effectively uh, stops the, the, the development of the canopy after uh, the, the beginning of July. But the more important value is at midday, when the stomatal are open and you have a high uh, radiation to make the photosynthesis work. In the pre-down, the, 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 the potential gives you the water balance when uh, there are not uh, um, uh, photosynthesis rates. You have that's, to, uh, that's, uh, a, that's exactly it, uh, uh, Maria. Uh, uh, under these conditions, at midday, you do not have stomatal conductance. It, it's, the, the stomata are totally closed, and the plant wow. is not photosynthesizing. Yeah. It, it just photosynthesizes in the beginning of the morning and in the end of the afternoon when temperatures go below 35 degrees, and the, it can photosynthesize. And uh, it's quite often that it happens that we even have um, uh, maturation arrests because of that. And the plant will, in, instead of, of photosynthesizing, derive energy from respiration during the night. Yeah, I see. So the water go to the leaves, that for sure, that you will have a big loss of uh, yield. Yeah, because that's it. why we have 3.2 tons per hectare of average <laughs> yield. <laughs> okay. 
Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much, Antonio. And for sure, we'll, uh, you could have other questions for Antonio in the next plenary uh, session. Now uh, we are moving to the final uh, presentation for our problem holders. And I would like to leave the floor for a quick presentation to uh, Massimiliano. Please, Massimiliano, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. Thank you all. Uh, we are approaching the, the final and the third and final uh, problem uh, for this living lab. I, I'm uh, very uh, pleased to have with us uh, uh, two more people from the MedGold uh, community partners. Uh, they are Matteo Ruggeri and Valentina Manstretta from Horta. Horta is a, is a, is a company um, and in, in their logo uh, there is written from research to field and uh, in the last more than uh, 10 years, uh, they developed uh, a large amount of knowledge, es essentially devoted for the uh, decision support systems. And, um, and not only in Italy, uh, Orta is uh, an Italian company, but no, they are working not only in Italy, but uh, in uh, many other uh, countries in uh, Europe. And uh, they are uh, they are a partner uh, of Medgold, as I told you before, and they are a key uh, partner for the Durum Wheat sector, uh, pilot service uh, uh, sector. Um, here today we have uh, uh, Matteo Ruggeri, uh, who is the coordinator of uh, several uh, food uh, supply production chains, but especially for the cereals one. And, um, and uh, Valentina Manstretta, uh, she is uh, also working in Horta and she is uh, more uh, devoted to the development uh, and uh, research uh, activities on um, international uh, programs. So uh, at this, uh, this moment, uh, I would like to uh, leave the floor to Matteo for uh, showing us uh, our uh, third and uh, final problem. Uh, Matteo, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks, Massimiliano. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yes, uh, for the 2021 Living Lab, uh, me and Valentina Mastretta are sub submitting you a problem for doing with uh, sector regarding fertilization. Next uh, slide, please. Okay, Durwit is the main ingredient of pasta and uh, in this graph you can see the thousand tons got by main producers. The, big, the biggest producers in a, um, is Europe, secondly Canada and North Africa. North Africa because uh, uh, in Arab countries produce uh, couscous. So not only pasta but also couscous uh, is made from. Uh, doing with. Also, Turkey and the United States of America are two big uh, players, as you can see in this graph. Next, please. Focusing on uh, Europe, uh, Italy, France, Spain, and Greece uh, are the, the most important doing with pro products, producers. Doing with, uh, unlike the soft wheat, uh, is not a commodity and the price is influenced by yield and stock of main players. It means Canada and Europe. In Europe, Italy is the main producer, uh, the most uh, favorable uh, region of Durum wheat cultivation are those uh, close to Adriatic Sea, near to Balkanic area. So uh, thus Emilia-Romagna region, in the north of the country, in the center, uh, Marche, and in the south, Apulia, and uh, Sicily to uh, the island. Next slide. The core business, okay, the core business of Orta is the implementation of the Chison support system. They are IT platform that uh, collect 
data from weather station and the soil, for example, and thanks to forecasting models, predict uh, diseases, uh, fertilization plan, and all um, decisions that farmers have to take during season can be supported by a model. Here you see our holistic approach where we try to build uh, decision support system to help to, uh, to, to send recommendation advices for all programs of season. For example, about protection, we have uh, for dual wheat uh, models for yellow and brown rust, polder mildew, and uh, septoria complex uh, and uh, fusarium headline. Not less important uh, is also the model for deoxynivalenol. Deoxynivalenol is an important mycotoxin, a very dangerous mycotoxin. So we have model to predict the risk of, of accumulation in the kernel of this mycotoxin. Then uh, we are implementing a model about aphids and uh, about abiotic stress, we have a model to predict uh, drought. It's not uh, very common irrigation of during wheat in Italy, but uh, it's important to understand if the yield will be high or lower, because if you have a dried soil, obviously the, the, the yield will be lower. About, uh, um, uh, about strategic uh, decision, uh, we have models to help to understand, to find the best density of sowing. So we have a um, recommendation about uh, seedling and uh, a fertilization plan with different doses and timing of application of nitrogen, different recommendation according to previous crop, uh, expected yield, uh, and so on. We help farmers, technicians and agronomists also for weed control, and uh, uh, we have a lot of database about pesticides, uh, fertilizers, uh, pesticides, and so on, to support uh, our models. So our approach is to build something in a single box where you put all knowledge, all research coming from university or private research, and uh, we built a decision support system, not only dual wheat, but also soft, soft wheat, uh, barley, maize, uh, some flour, and so on. Okay, next. One of the main problems of crop management is the fertilization to maximize the yield. During wheat uh, needs mainly uh, of nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. Phosphorus is normally spread over the field in autumn, just before sowing, uh, whereas nitrogen should be applied in spring uh, during the major growth stages from February to April, usually. Potassium is usually abundant in Italian soil, and farmers don't, uh, uh, farmers don't apply potassium regularly. Therefore, the greatest difficulties, uh, difficult is managing fertilization concerning uh, nitrogen. And here you can see the, the question, how the crop manager of dual wheat should use the seasonal forecast to optimize nitrogen fertilization, to increase yield and quality. Is a big problem because uh, the doses to apply is not always the same quantity. It depends on the season, yield, variety, uh, soil futures, and so on. Next. Thank you. Uh, here you see uh, some useful, useful data. The durum wheat yield in the north of Italy is usually six, seven tons per hectare. Seven probably is a bit higher than average, but uh, uh, we work often with uh, efficient uh, farms, so it's not difficult uh, for more uh, bigger farmer to get seven tons per Per hectare. The price uh, is uh, a bit lower than uh, 300 euro per ton, 285 euros per ton. And uh, uh, it's important to understand that uh, uh, we have kilogram of, nit of nitrogen, called unit of nitrogen, and kilogram of fertilizer. And uh, 
Uh, urea, for example, the percentage of nitrogen is 46%. So it means that if you have 100 kilo of urea, it means that you have available for your crop 46 nitrogen units because not the 100% the the of urea is nitrogen. Uh, in the second uh, section, you find something about how to define the fertilization plan of nitrogen. Uh, in our um, model to predict uh, uh, the fertilization plan of the season, we start, to, um, to we start with uh, a sentence. We need usually 30 units of nitrogen for each ton of grain get by fields. So if you have, if you want to collect, uh, harvest seven tons, you have to multiply seven per 30 units. And uh, this is uh, the first step to predict uh, the dosage to apply. But it's not so simply because you have to change this first uh, multiplication according to weather, according to soil futures uh, and other quality experts. And um, here you have also uh, some details about ammonium nitrate because usually in, uh, in Italy for uh, wheat we use urea for ammonium nitrate. Urea 46% of nitrogen, instead ammonium nitrate the percentage of nitrogen is lower 27%. Ammonium nitrate is a fertilizer providing uh, nitrogen with uh, a fast release compared with urea. Also, urea is quite fast, but is lower than ammonium nitrate. So if you have to apply fertilizer uh, and to absorb or take nitrogen by the plant in a few days, you have to apply nitrogen. If you have more time, because it's not late for and a fertilization you can use, for example, urea. Urea is, um, the risk of leaching is lower with urea respect to ammonium nitrate. And this is another aspect because if you apply fertilizer during, a, uh, uh, during days with heavy rain, you have a severe problem with leaching. And here you find also the price of fertilizers. Uh, the price depends on uh, crude oil uh, quotation, not only for urea, but also for ammonium nitrate. Next. Uh, here, um, you can see uh, how... Um, uh, how Sorry, Matteo, a couple when, of minutes. Okay. Minutes. In Italy, um, we usually sow in autumn uh, wheat, usually in October or November, in the farm and the farm of North of Italy. In November or December, usually in the south of Italy. Uh, instead, uh, harvesting is usually in June. And in this picture, you see all step of growing staging from germination to harvesting. And usually we apply fertilizer during tillering to, uh, uh, to uh, booting. Um, okay, next. Next slide. slide. And uh, here we pay attention to drivers to defining fertilization needs. For the dose uh, to apply, it depends on expected yield, quality, for example, the test weight or the uh, percentage of protein that you have to, to get in the, in the kernel, the weather, previous crop and soil futures. For the time of application, total nitrogen dose, plant needs, plant uptake, leaching risk. So uh, we have and farmers to take into account a lot of drivers to define uh, how much and the timing for fertilization. In the two pictures, you see an example of urea, the picture of the left and on the right, you see the amount that usually farmers have to manage during season. Uh, not few kilograms, but uh, uh, 
hundred thousand uh, kilograms of urea for several hectares. Okay, next. The 40% of nitrogen needed for the plant is usually already available in the soil thanks to uh, previous fertil uh, fertilization uh, applied uh, the previous crop. And uh, uh, in this graph, you see also the nutrient uptake during season. As you can see here, uh, the most important period for nitrogen uptake by the plant is in the spring. So it is not useful to apply nitrogen in autumn or in winter. It is too early and you increase the risk of leaching. So farmers uh, usually apply fertilizer and nitrogen fertilizers usually in February and March. Here is just an idea to understand uh, when plant needs main uh, units of nitrogen. Next. Okay, the total amount of nitrogen to be distributed needs to be split into several action, uh, several timings, because uh, usually farmers apply nitrogen in two or three steps during season, not all fertilizer in one step. Like us, we don't eat only at midday. We eat the breakfast, the lunch, the dinner, the same for the plant. It needs uh, more nitrogen during crop season. And uh, in the picture, you see the step where usually farmers apply fertilizer. For example, uh, could be during tillering, during stem elongation, and during booting. Or, uh, for example, in the south of Italy, uh, they start with the first application of fertilizer um, in uh, pre-sowing or uh, close to sowing, but it's not a uh, usual practice in the north. Because in the north, winter is usually uh, a rainy season and the leaching is higher in the north of Italy with respect to the south. Next. Okay. Uh, yes, here you see other three um, topics, uh, problems that uh, um, participants have to take into account. So we have different uh, growing stages and different timing where we can apply fertilizer. When you have a lot of rainfalls, for example, rainfalls above to uh, 20 millimeters per day, you cannot apply fertilizer because uh, uh, the risk of compaction, compaction sorry, and the uh, problem uh, with uh, driving the fields, uh, farmers cannot apply when uh, it's rain, obviously. And farmers usually don't stock fertilizer in the farm. Like in Spain, probably, also here in Italy, the farms are very small, usually have 20, 30 hectares of dual wheat per farm. So they don't stock in fertilizer on farm. They buy just a few days before, uh, before spread out fertilizer on fields. So with this slide, I've shown all experts that participants should take into account for the task. Um, now I give the floor to Valentina for the last slide, for the last one. Thanks. Thank you, Matteo. Just very briefly, as uh, we are running out of time, this is just uh, a slide to present you the work which uh, was carried out uh, during the medical project in uh, this uh, for Durham Wheat in which we co-developed some uh, indexes that probably will be presented uh, to you also during the living lab. And um, we co-developed uh, these with uh, agronomists, uh, technicians and farmers and uh, identified uh, in this table uh, the, the one which related to most to the fertilization issue. Uh, so as you can see, we identified the four indexes which are mainly calculated during tillering or from uh, the stem elongation to the booting phenological phases, which uh, 
are the the ones in which during which uh, during which we which needs more nitrogen and they are the indexes are mostly related to the soil hydrological balance or on the amount of precipitation which can uh, favor the effect of the fertilizer or can uh, uh, pose a risk for nitrogen le leaching. This is uh, all uh, from my side, from our Thank you. Thank you very much, Matteo. Thank you very much, Valentina, for this quite comprehensive presentation of the problem for the Durum wheat. Uh, as you said, we are uh, running out of time. We are just a little bit late, so uh, I think that we could ask your question to Matteo and Valentina in the next uh, uh, plenary session when we uh, will have time for a specific question for each of the problem um, presented today. Uh, so I think that we could uh, uh, immediately move to uh, Marta because uh, Marta would also show you uh, how our idea on the teams that should work on this specific problem. And uh, so I would like to leave the floor to Marta for uh, this um, for, for this short contribution. And now I'll show you the slide that Marta has presented. Yeah, thank, thanks, Alessandro, and thanks 